Um, okay, so let me pull up some of my prompts and the feedback we got from our clients and staff. Um, da, 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 da. And then, all right, without further ado, I think what our format's gonna be, David, is you can introduce yourself, uh, um, give your spiel, um, and then we have some questions and prompts from our clients and staff via a survey we had completed. And then I'm gonna call on people who are in the room to see if they have anything that they wanna share with or ask of you. How does that sound? Yep, sounds good. Okay, um, well then I will turn it over uh, to you, David, to introduce yourself. Um, and just for everybody who's watching in the future, uh, my name is Winston Parsons, Community Engagement Specialist at the Richmond Senior Center. Um, and this is another in our Meet the Candidate series. And today we're joined by David Lee, candidate for Richmond District Supervisor. So David, uh, take it away. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm David Lee, I'm a native San Franciscan, lived in the Richmond District most of my life, went to high school, um, Wallenberg High School, and uh, raised my family here uh, in the Richmond. Um, about uh, ten, over 10 years ago, my wife and I started a small business here in the neighborhood on Geary. Uh, which is still going strong. We employ people from the neighborhood and um, have many clients uh, in the, uh, from the neighborhood, as including small businesses. Um, I'm an educator. I have been uh, in education for most of my career. Uh, worked 15 years uh, at San Francisco State teaching political science. I also uh, run a community college English second language uh, support program. Uh, that includes job training for about uh, 1,500 uh, students of all ethnic backgrounds, um, speakers of Spanish, uh, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, Laotian, many uh, different groups. Uh, and um, I support, uh, my, my department uh, my, that I oversee supports uh, the students and uh, faculty uh, that work in ESOL and help um, immigrants transition into uh, jobs and uh, careers and educational, um, uh, higher education. Uh, in addition, I've worked in the nonprofit sector. I've uh, been executive director of a nonprofit organization that registers voters uh, for over 27 years. Uh, we've registered uh, immigrants and Asian Americans to vote and have uh, added over 100,000 uh, people to the voter rolls in, um, in that time. Um, so I have a varied background. Um, I have a doctorate in education uh, as well as a master's in political science and have been um, involved in community work uh, for uh, many years, including as a commissioner of uh, San Francisco Recreation Park uh, Department uh, for seven years. I was on the board of the League of Women Voters for many years and uh, KQED uh, for about eight years um, and have been uh, involved in the neighborhood. Um, I was chair of the Richmond Community Police Advisory Board, which worked on pedestrian safety. Uh, one of my proudest achievements was uh, getting a traffic light put in on um, 22nd and Gary in front of the self-help. Uh, which at that time, uh, there was a lot of uh, accidents that were happening to our seniors because they would get off on the um, northern side of Gary uh, from the bus to, and cross to the southern side where self-help was and uh, people were getting hit. So we were able to get a, a traffic light put in uh, during my tenure as a chair of the, um, the uh, police community advisory board. Um, so, you know, with that, I'll, I'll take questions. Okay, thanks, David. Um, let me pull up my notes here, just a moment. Um, well, actually, I have a question off the top of my head. You mentioned earlier uh, you run a small business in the Richmond. Do you mind sharing uh, what business you uh, you operate? Yeah, my wife owns a um, uh, is the agent. She's insurance. Uh, it's insurance financial services. Um, okay. So she uh, insures. Uh, we have a, a small staff. Uh, that insures um, small businesses, um, renters. We do a lot of rental uh, policies um, and um, uh, people in the community, cars as well. 
Got it. Cool. Um, so one of the first questions we had, uh, we've been asking all the candidates, um, share a, a little bit about your core values or beliefs. Um, and along with that, um, like how would you navigate Winston, working with- Sorry to, oh, yeah. to interrupt you. I don't mean to, oh, go ahead. don't want any translation, right? No, thank you for asking. Okay. I appreciate you checking. Um, I don't, a few people have hopped on later in the, the sessions, but I, I, at the moment, I doubt anybody is actually going to need it live. Okay. I'm just going to listen in then, but um, okay. if, if, you, if you do, if anyone does, uh, let me know. I'll hit you up. Thank you. I appreciate it, Dixon. Thanks. Um, um, well, I, I've been uh, serving the community for my entire career, and that's kind of been the theme of uh, my service. I've always worked either in the nonprofit or education sectors and public education. Uh, for instance, in community college uh, or in um, the CSU system, serving students. Um, most of my students are uh, first generation. I have many formerly incarcerated students and undocumented students also that, that I serve uh, and uh, support. And I've always uh, believed in helping uh, the immigrant community, supporting the immigrant community uh, with the um, enfranchisement into the civic uh, affairs and politics of the city by registering people to vote and getting people out to vote and uh, making sure that people know their rights. Um, so that's, that's been the, the common thread of my work. Got it. And if, uh, if you're elected to supervisor uh, for the dis district one for the Richmond, how would you manage working with colleagues that you might disagree with on the board to uh, navigate those and still I pass work in legislation? Education, my friend, <laughs> <laughs> I work in education and there are uh, very smart people who uh, disagree with each other, uh, who must work together to get um, to form consensus. So I've done that my entire career. Uh, and I know how to work with people who have um, uh, different views uh, and to build coalitions and to get things done. Um, you know, uh, higher education, particularly in the community college world, uh, is all about committees. Uh, everything is done um, through consensus and through um, coalition building and um, working with um, lots of stakeholders, uh, faculty, classified, uh, administration, students, um, much like in the uh, real world in, um, at the Board of uh, Supervisors, uh, working with um, uh, board members from different backgrounds and different um, perspectives. So I'm, I'm experienced and well-versed uh, in, in, in doing that, and I've done it my entire career. Got it. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I might call on one of our participants. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, disability and aging services? Um, what funding policies um, um, and experiences you would bring or advocate for um, to make it easier to age with dignity uh, in the Richmond district? Well, um, a person in the community college world, I've worked closely with the DSPS department which uh, serves disabled um, students and um, students with special needs. And I'm very familiar uh, with um, the, uh, the issues that uh, our students face. And I know um, as chair of the Richmond Community Advisory Board, when I worked on pedestrian safety um, uh, issues and particularly um, elder abuse, and um, uh, issues of, over um, uh, income disparity, food insecurity, um, and resident, you know, home, uh, ins you know, housing insecurity with our elder population and disabled population. I'm, I'm really familiar with, with that, uh, with the policies that we need. And clearly here in the Richmond, I think pedestrian safety is still very much uh, an important uh, priority, even though it doesn't get as much intention. Um, you know, we need to uh, make our streets safer for our senior citizens. We also need public transportation. Many of our seniors depend uh, almost exclusively on public transportation. And I'm a big supporter of bringing BART to the Richmond district uh, because it will help our seniors get 
around our disabled get around the city economically um, and uh, will make them more independent and able to um, uh, participate fully in, uh, in the social uh, and civic economic life. Uh, and our disabled community depends heavily on um, public transportation. When I was on the um, Community Advisory Board, uh, we worked to make sure that um, the uh, Muni, uh, the, the 38 Gary, had enough stops for uh, the disabled community because uh, there was, a, at a time, some five or six years ago, uh, Muni was eliminating stops on Gary and uh, trying to fast track uh, many of the, 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 the bus routes, but that was leaving a lot of our um, disabled community um, without ability to board uh, and to get close enough to their uh, destinations because they were, they were eliminating stops. So we advocated, I advocated for uh, making sure that uh, we had enough stops to serve uh, the, the community. I'm also very uh, concerned about um, our uh, rental crisis with eviction crisis that is looming. Uh, I wanna keep our uh, disabled community in their homes um, and uh, very uh, much support the idea of um, a, a moratorium on evictions during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and to, to keep people in their homes, especially the disabled community. Got it. Uh, one potential follow-up question and then I'll uh, ask some of our participants. A lot of folks, I mean, there's been talk for a very long time about BART to the Richmond and other transportation projects. A two-part question, how would you facilitate or, or fund BART to the Richmond? Um, and second question is, what would be some of your policies or plans around paratransit? Got it. Uh, first of all, people think that I'm the originator of this idea oh. of the campaign. And uh, I assure you, uh, I'm, I'm not the creator of the idea of bringing BART to the Richmond. Uh, this has been talked about for 40 years. In fact, we used to have rail that ran down uh, Gary Boulevard. And the original BART um, plan was to include a tube uh, that ran uh, north-south from uh, the Richmond all the way up to uh, Marin to connect uh, BART. So there would be two tubes. Uh, in 2016, a $3.5 billion regional BART bond was passed. It was the largest um, BART bond uh, passed in um, BART's history. Uh, which allocated a part of their, that bond to expanding uh, BART service into the Richmond. Um, and in fact, uh, just last year in 2019, BART allocated 10 million, the first piece of it, into a study uh, to look at expanding BART into the Richmond. So this is very much not um, a creation of, of my imagination. This is something that is actually happening. And if you Google uh, BART um, expansion to the Richmond, you'll find many articles. This has been talked about uh, for many years and uh, including by our, our current supervisor, uh, Sandra Feuer, uh, who uh, was very supportive of the idea uh, when it was announced. Um, and that's what I'm working on uh, is to make sure that this happened. As supervisor, uh, this critical period between um, now and when BART um, uh, is actually uh, uh, brought to the Richmond uh, must be spent organizing the community uh, to determine which route it would take. Uh, would it go to underground under Geary Boulevard? Would it go underground under Fulton Boulevard out to the beach? Would BART uh, then uh, potentially take a, a northern turn at the Park Presidio and cross into um, a second tube, which is another project that is um, uh, being envisioned. Uh, that's a 50 year long span project to build a second tube uh, into Marin. Uh, so these are, these are the things that the next supervisor uh, should be thinking about and should be organizing uh, the community uh, to say, we want BART in the Richmond to get consensus on the route, which route it would take uh, to get 
people uh, uh, behind it so that um, the planners uh, can, can move forward. Now, the second thing is that there's federal dollars that are coming in to uh, BART uh, to support these expansion projects. For instance, just two weeks ago, um, the federal government awarded BART with a $1.2 billion grant uh, for infrastructure. Um, under a Biden administration, it is very likely that um, BART will receive even more funds uh, uh, from federal dollars to support um, projects. And I think as supervisor, uh, we would be in I would be in position to advocate to make sure that those funds get put into place um, so that we can bring BART to the Richmond. Um, I work closely uh, with BART um, because some of my job training programs are with BART. Um, I, in my, the college that I uh, work at is Laney College in Oakland, and it's a community college, public community college, uh, and our job programs are with BART, and BART headquarters is, is right in our neighborhood. So I'm very familiar with the planners, and um, we also, uh, I, I've also known uh, James Fang, a former BART member who um, passed away recently. Uh, and Quentin Kopp, Senator, State Senator Quentin Kopp, uh, who, uh, who uh, have helped work with me on this transportation plan. And uh, uh, both think that this is something that's going to happen uh, within the next 10 years. And it's really uh, critical now that we um, let people know about it. And uh, I promise the, the COVID period will um, eventually end and we will need um, BART to the Richmond. We will need public transportation. And that requires some forward thinking uh, from the supervisor who represents the Richmond. So that's, that's why BART to the Richmond is, is so important to me. I think it's, it's important to uh, a lot of people uh, in the district, particularly people who live in the outer parts of the district. Um, you know, it could take an hour just to get from um, the beach all the way to a BART station downtown, you know, an hour and a half, depending on traffic. And that's even before you hit a BART, a BART a train to get, take you over to the East Bay. Uh, so this is something that um, I think is very real for a lot of residents of the Richmond. And as supervisor, uh, this is my priority. Uh, we have um, a, a, a BART a float that is um, traveling around in the Richmond district to show people what BART to the Richmond looks like, and you'll see it in the next couple of weeks. We've been out uh, campaigning. People really love the idea, um, especially with all the wildfires that have been going on, global warming, uh, the drought. Um, who could argue that um, having a safe, clean way of, of, of getting around um, uh, would help uh, reduce uh, CO2 emissions and auto emissions, which are, are the primary uh, reasons why uh, we have we have global warming. Got it. Um, and real uh, one other the uh, other question: uh, What about paratransit? What what's your familiarity with it? What would you uh, see your relationship uh, with paratransit being as supervisor? Yeah, I, I, paratransit I think is really critical service. I know uh, many seniors, many disabled people in our neighborhood uh, depend upon it. Um, and I uh, support expanding um, uh, those services and making sure that they are um, free or as affordable as possible to the community. Uh, this is something where uh, I believe that um, uh, it's, a, it's a lifeline for um, thousands of people. And um, I, I, my, my father, when he was um, uh, ill, dependent on paratransit to get around. So I'm very, um, uh, I have a personal um, history with that service and I think that uh, I would support it, of course. Got it, okay. Uh, I think I'm gonna ask a few of our participants if they have any questions or issues to bring up to you. Uh, Sharon, are you there? Is there anything that you wanna bring up uh, to David? No, not now. Okay. Um, Cheryl, what about you? 
Um, sure. Um, I wanted to ask um, how you feel relations among Richmond District community members is. So that's like neighbor to neighbor merchants, residents, um, visitors, workers. Do you feel there's unity, understanding, and mutual respect? Or do you see there's room for improvement? And how would you foster that? No, I think that's a really uh, great um, question. I think that uh, clearly COVID-19 has strained uh, many relationships, especially for a lot of our elderly and disabled uh, populations because they are um, uh, no longer able to live as independently as they once did. They're staying home, uh, which uh, have uh, created increasing mental uh, stress on people because of the social isolation. Uh, not everybody has access to internet. Um, not everybody um, is familiar with uh, social media or know how to use social media. Uh, and many of our seniors uh, are very lonely. Um, and I know this um, uh, personally because our students, the students that I serve, uh, the population I serve um, tend to be older population. Um, uh, immigrants over uh, 50 and uh, uh, you know I see the uh, what that's ha what what that's done to social relationships um, I think also it uh, creates more challenges for people uh, as uh, social distancing um, have forced people to um, uh, isolate themselves either in pods or in smaller groups than they normally have. I haven't seen my co-workers uh, since March uh, from San Francisco State or from uh, my community college. Um, I haven't talked to, you know, I, other than from Zoom, I haven't met personally with, with them. Um, so it, COVID has really challenged us. And I think uh, at the same time, I see a lot of great um, uh, uh, work being done by people volunteers, people who are out uh, checking on our seniors. I've done uh, food delivery as well uh, with my daughter who has volunteered to, um, to go out and uh, deliver uh, food to um, uh, meals to seniors. Uh, so, so really, this is a challenging time. And overall, I, I feel that, uh, um, you know, people, um, you know, are, are, are trying their best and, um, I am also concerned about the uh, anti-Asian um, uh, incidents of, of racism that we're seeing here in the Richmond district. Uh, I've lived here most of my life and I've never seen the level or heard the level of anti-Asian uh, xenophobia uh, that um, we've witnessed in the last um, six or seven months. Um, stories of, of people uh, being spat upon, uh, people being called names, um, uh, simply because uh, they look differently than others. And uh, I've all, the Richmond I know uh, and grew up in has always been a diverse, tolerant place. Um, we were uh, a place where um, lots of incomes, lots of you know, when I grew up in the Richmond, uh, the Richmond was a blue collar area. It was a lot of working people. It wasn't a, a neighborhood where uh, homes are selling for $2 million. Um, it was a very much a, a neighborhood of families. And, um, you know, to hear about these incidents now um, and to actually um, talk to people who've experienced them um, are, is really alarming. And I think we all need to do more to foster um, uh, more sensitivity of what people are going through and the challenges that, that are hap uh, the people are enduring. And we, ne we need to show more of our humanity to one another. Good question, Cheryl. Uh, and thanks for answering, David. My next question for you, let me pull up my notes here. Um, the next question for me? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'm on a call actually with oh. another someone else named David. <laughs> One of my neighbors who's, who's eating breakfast out here. His name is David too. <laughs> you can answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So my next question for you is, how would you support and partner with community-based organizations, senior centers, nonprofits, um, things like that? Um, and it, one of the things that comes to mind is there's like a regular quarterly meeting of the Richmond Community Coalition, which is a bunch of community-based organizations and small business owners. And then uh, I help facilitate a, a monthly senior roundtable um, with other senior serving agencies in the Richmond. Um, and how would you engage with them? And what, what else would you envision um, for supporting uh, and partnering with uh, community-based orgs? Well, I, I come from having worked in community-based organizations um, and from the nonprofit world. And I also uh, have worked with Rec and Park where um, the department um, regularly partnered with um, nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations. So I'm a strong uh, believer in, in um, uh, connecting with CBOs and making sure the CBOs are well-funded from the city. Uh, as a supervisor, I would advocate for uh, more support um, uh, for our CBOs, more grant funding, more uh, resources, because I know that CBOs um, do a lot of really important work and uh, truly uh, connect to the community. Um, and I support uh, the work that you're doing, um, networking and, and across CBOs, uh, because you're closest to the people and what's needed in the community. And as supervisor, I would rely on, on you and on CBOs to let me know what's, what, what's needed. And I would go out and get the resources for you, which is, I believe, the job of the supervisor uh, is to advocate for the Richmond. And uh, that's, that's why I'm running, to put the Richmond first, to make sure that the Richmond gets the resources uh, uh, we need. Uh, to support the CBOs doing the great work that um, that you're doing out in the field. Got it. Thanks for answering. Um, I am. Ah, here's one of our next uh, questions. What is your plan or vision for San Francisco's COVID-19 response in 2021 if you are elected supervisor? Great. Um, you know, I I believe that um, we need. Um, there are a lot of people hurting right now, let's be honest. I know people who have lost their life savings, uh, people who are facing eviction, uh, small businesses that have been forced to close, uh, small businesses that are operating with enormous debt um, uh, that they have to repay. Um, uh, people are suffering right now. And, uh, you know, there's no, no one that I've talked to or no one that I know who lives in the district, who lives in Richmond district, who's saying, I'm doing great. This is like the best year of my life. No, uh, what I'm hearing is exactly the opposite. This is the worst year of our lives. We are, have been put into a place we never thought we would ever find ourselves in without warning. Um, and I believe that uh, really important uh, during COVID-19, not to raise taxes on people. And I, that's why I oppose the uh, tax increases that are on the November ballot, uh, because I feel that uh, so many people uh, would be harmed by those tax increases during COVID-19. I think people need a chance to recover. I think government, um, City Hall needs to give people a break and let people have a chance to, to recover economically. Um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, we pay um, an enormous amount of money in taxes um, uh, and cost of living to, to, to stay here in the Richmond district. Even people who are in rent controlled um, apartments are uh, seeing their cost of living increase to the point where uh, they can't afford to live here. Um, and I think we need to give people a break. I think I really do. I think during COVID-19, I think the city should not be raising taxes, especially at a time uh, when the budget just keeps growing um, by leaps and bounds. In the last five years, um, it went from uh, $8 billion budget to this year, a $13 billion budget. And, um, uh, and yet, even with those kinds of uh, dollars, the um, uh, you know, the, the city's still facing a budget deficit. 
Um, so I, I think I think we need to help the, the regular people who live here, the, the middle class, the lower income people who can't afford these, these tax increases and need jobs. Um, and one of the real concerns I have is that uh, uh, the city raising taxes now may drive employers out of the city and that will hurt uh, small businesses who depend on those employees. Uh, it would hurt uh, people um, like uh, the, my students who are looking for jobs right now because there, there are few, there's just huge job losses that are um, that, that, that uh, the hotel industry uh, is facing. For instance, a lot of our students uh, go into the hotel industry either through culinary or through uh, hospitality and they won't, they don't have those opportunities anymore. Um, and uh, I just feel that we, we need to um, address our economy and get people back on their feet and give people an opportunity to recover. Okay. Um, let's see if anybody else, uh, Sharon, do you have any issues you want to bring up or questions you want to ask of David at this point? No, I don't. All right. Um, Cheryl, anything, anything more before I ask David one or two more things or give him some other time to share some of his platform? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at some of our survey responses and one of the other top issues that came up um, for some of our clients was uh, homelessness. Um, what would be, talk about your experience around <clears throat> working around that issue and what approaches you would take if you were elected supervisor? Well, you know, homelessness has, um, has been um, a part of the Richmond for many years. Um, when I was on the Committee Advisory Board, this is about seven years ago, uh, homelessness already then was uh, one of the top concerns in the, in the neighborhood. Maybe this was nine years ago, actually. Um, so what COVID-19 did was um, really uh, peeled the, uh, the Band-Aid off. And, um, you know, we saw homeless camps um, uh, emerge on 18th and, and Gary Boulevard, uh, homeless camps out on La Playa. Um, there were homeless uh, camps uh, on 24th and Balboa, places that we uh, had not seen uh, homeless camps before in our in our neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I think what was what's really important is that the city move people um, into hotels. We have hotel rooms uh, that the city had been already paying for, and that's why I advocated all through this campaign that the city um, uh, do more. And the city was slow to move uh, in that direction. Obviously, um, uh, that's changed because uh, the homeless camps now are gone. If you look at 18th and the um, Gary, the, the tents that were there are, are no longer there. Uh, the graffiti has been cleaned up. Um, if you look at 24th and Balboa, the homeless tents are gone from there. Uh, La Playa in front of the Safeway, um, the homeless uh, tents are gone. Um, and then they've moved that, since moved down to another end of La Playa uh, along the beach. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think that um, um, the city needs to do more to get um, homeless people into supportive housing. And I think it's really critical that we um, uh, allocate the funds um, needed to purchase hotels now that are coming onto the market or motels coming onto the market and um, uh, create long-term permanent supportive housing. This may be uh, a rare opportunity for us to do so, especially since um, now that Prop C funds some $600 million in homeless, dedicated homeless fun, uh, um, uh, funds for homeless services has been released by the courts. Um, it's unprecedented amount of money that is coming in that we can spend that those funds wisely to build more uh, supportive long-term housing for homeless uh, because the solution uh, to homelessness is housing. And I think for the first time in a very long time, we're going to have um, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to, to spend on, on those funds. 
um, on, on those services that are, are really needed. Um, I think also we need to, um, I'm in favor of uh, Mayor Breed's um, uh, readjustment, uh, reallocation of uh, police funding uh, the, to uh, address um, uh, mental health crisis. Some of the, the, those funds will be used to hire mental health counselors, which I think are, are really uh, needed, um, and uh, to provide services. Um, that uh, address root causes of homelessness uh, rather than treating homelessness as a crime. I don't believe that homelessness, um, be being poor, um, is a crime. Uh, I think that we should be um, addressing the root causes of homelessness uh, and mental health uh, crises. Got it. So much related to that, and when you're, uh, you said earlier, um, that the city has a projected deficit of nearly $2 billion. And that's just for this upcoming budget, you know, cycle, where we don't know what the lasting impacts fiscally uh, of this recession, or who knows uh, what, what we'll be calling it later, um, will be. So how would you uh, fund some of the things you were talking about, besides the, the Prop C money that you referenced? Um, how would you allocate uh, that money or also work with the mayor uh, who's the main arbiter of determining the city's budget? Well, first, I think we, the Board of Supervisors have been asleep at the switch. Um, clearly that was the case at Department of Public Works, which was responsible for cleaning up our streets and for addressing many of the problems that we've been talking about for the last half an hour. Uh, because um, you have the, the uh, department head um, who has pled guilty to corruption, uh, admitting to um, the misallocation of taxpayer funds uh, that were meant to address many of the issues that we're talking about. Um, the, the, the same is true of other departments that have uh, been uh, put under um, FBI scrutiny. Um, I think there needs to be an overhaul of uh, how co public contracts are being awarded. There needs to be more transparency to make sure that, uh, in fact, do we have a $2 billion budget deficit? I would like to find out how uh, to, to have an audit of um, these departments to make sure that the public dollars are being um, properly spent to and properly being um, uh, scrutinized uh, and uh, accounted for by the Board of Supervisors, which uh, up until the scandal broke has not happened, clearly. Um, so I think there needs to be a lot of um, review and oversight by the Board uh, to find out how real is that $2 billion number and how much of it is due to mismanagement and to um, uh, lack of oversight. Uh, I also look at the salaries that our top managers are making, top department heads. Uh, we have the highest paid uh, mayor in the United States. We have uh, some of our positions, uh, the police chief, is one of the highest paid police chiefs um, in the country. Uh, we have many of our department heads uh, earning um, high uh, six-figure, multiple six-figure, uh, 200,000 uh, and more type salaries. We have rampant overtime uh, with the Chronicle reporting that uh, the Sheriff's Department uh, had some 19 out of the top 20 overtime earners, uh, meaning that, that their base sal some of them having a base salary that is only um, 100000 but yet they're, with overtime, they're earning over $300,000, $350,000. Uh, so do you, there, there is a lot of uh, accountability that needs to be put into place. That's a board uh, supervisor's job. Uh, I would ask those questions uh, before um, uh, accepting the uh, $2 billion uh, deficit uh, as fact. I would also uh, want assurances that with all bond funds 
and public dollars that are uh, being uh, passed by voters, that those funds are actually spent um, in the way that voters have um, uh, been promised, and that there is accountability in the process all the way through. Um, so I, I would start. I would start there. All right. Well, thank you, David. I'm going to ask <clears throat> uh, Sharon or Cheryl. Do you have anything else that you want to ask? I'm good. Oh yeah, no more um, questions for me at the moment. Okay. Uh, well, David, um, I've exhausted my list of questions and priorities that have been uh, sent to me by our clients uh, and staff. What? Um, I will actually have one more. I almost forgot, um, and then I'll let you make any final statements that you'd like to make. Um, what areas for growth or learning or populations do you think you need to learn more about? Well, you know, I'm, I'm an educator, so I really believe I, um, uh, you know, I'm, that I have an open mind, that I want to, to learn. I'm, I'm interested in learning. Um, I have always had a hunger to know what um, people are doing, what um, concerns people's concerns are, um, and um, you know, I I, I really um, uh, believe that um, uh, you know I, I'm my mind is a, like a sponge. I love talking to people. I love uh, getting information and, and sharing ideas and listening to people and hearing from people of all different kinds of perspectives. Um, I work in a very, uh, I'm, I'm blessed in the sense that I work in a very diverse uh, environment uh, with lots of uh, smart people, lots of different uh, perspectives. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been able to um, uh, get things done because I've had an open mind and a willingness to listen. And I think that's really uh, important in a supervisor. Um, and that's what something I will bring to this job, which um, is an open mind and uh, somebody who uh, uh, will listen and will take the time to talk to people and to understand what, what people are saying. Got it. Well, thank um, you, David. Yo, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. I do have a question for you, David. I would like to know what motivated you to uh, run as a candidate for District 1? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've lived here most of my life. As I said, I uh, decided to enter this race because I just saw that a lot of, um, you know, uh, the rich men uh, was hurting. And we really needed a candidate who was going to focus on bringing resources back to the Richmond district to put the Richmond first. Um, that's that's why I decided to run. Um, we have um, candidates from one political faction, like the mayor's faction, or from the board of supervisors faction, uh, the current incumbent. And I wanted to be an independent voice that was going to be for the people. Uh, to represent the people of the Richmond and to, to advocate for the Richmond because I feel that our neighborhood has been ignored and has been um, left out of many of the decisions that um, uh, we should be included in. Um, one of the reasons uh, I really strongly support BART to the Richmond is, you know, we've been paying for BART. The Richmond has been paying for BART all these years but we have not been served by BART. And I believe it's time that BART serves the Richmond. And I believe it's time that uh, the Richmond gets the attention and the voice it deserves at City Hall. And that's why I'm, I'm running. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, I'm juggling uh, multiple conversations in the back of my head. I'm, I'm hearing concerns about ants. <laughs> this is something I've shared before as well. Um, so David, do you have anything uh, that you want to add finally? Um, yeah, I, I would just like to say, um, uh, oh, uh, one, one issue with the BART to the Richmond, I would like to clarify. Um, BART is not Muni. 
uh, BART is, uh, uh, you know, is a different um, entity than Muni. People get that confused. They look at Muni and what Muni's done um, on Van Ness and uh, uh, in Chinatown with the subway. BART is a different entity. It's a regional entity. BART closed um, the year, the COVID-19 year, with a surplus. BART has access to federal funds, regional funds uh, that Muni does not. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a one important distinction. And secondly, that BART uh, to the Richmond uh, is not, um, uh, is a capital project. And a capital project meaning that bonds uh, fund, fund it, regional bonds um, uh, fund this um, BART to Richmond. So uh, that's, that's important to note. Um, finally, I just wanted to uh, thank you all of you for taking the time to meet with me. Um, I'm open to uh, any questions you may have, uh, any concerns you may have. So just feel free to email me, call me, or reach out to my campaign. We have 19 days left in this election. Uh, so uh, we're going to be working hard every single day to get the vote out. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, um, to speak with you today, to meet with you. Thank you, David. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll, uh, afterwards, after we've got this video uploaded to, to YouTube, our YouTube page, uh, I'll make sure that we share the link with you. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye. It's nice meeting all of you. Mm -hmm. And thank you thank for you, being Winston. thank you for being available, Dixon. I really appreciate it. Yes, oh no you. problem. Thank you, Winston. Yeah. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Bye bye. Bye.